important even than me thinking that she was confident, which is hugely important. I felt that philosophically we were aligned. I think I felt that we were after the same thing, um, and that's really important to me. Um, Did you have the same kind of conversation with Ryan, telling him what was important to you and public records uh, and open government? Yeah, and I, my, my sense of Ryan is that he is a decent human being who's trying to do the right thing. I, 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 I you know, I, I think he is in a very, has, was in a very difficult position. Um, I think there is a tremendous amount of influence that Marty has over the firm. Uh, one of the issues that came up repeatedly, and I witnessed this, um, you know, I, I would be there, you know, for a day or part of a day to talk to the attorneys about cases or whatever. And, and a, a lot of my interactions with the firm wasn't just as a client. It was also, hey, what do you think we ought to do? Or, you know, there, there were some procedural questions they had, but mainly it was sort of really trying to understand the lay of the land as far as public records litigation is concerned, because I've obviously done a lot more than they had. And I was very happy to, to engage them in that respect. But frequently when I was there, Marty would come in and, um, you know, just sort of, uh, it was a train wreck. I mean, uh, he was very opinionated uh, about how cases ought to be handled, um, which I found, at first it was a little charming, uh, but then it just became really annoying because it's like, wait a minute, I understand you're financing the foundation and you're financing the law firm, but you don't have a voice here. I mean, this isn't, the, the, the foundation is not your toy. Um, you don't have any standing to have any input here. Um, even if you are the donor, you're, you're, you're not on the board, you're not an employee. I'm the only person that has a discretion about this. So he would come in and, and in front of the lawyers and you try to direct the litigation? I don't know if direct is the right word. He would come back there and, and very much sort of, you know, this is what I think ought to be done on these cases. Um, was this a regular occurrence when oh, you yeah, were there? Oh, yeah, very regular. Yeah, I mean, I, at least when I was there, yeah, it was very common. Um, and you expressed your disappointment or? or... Yeah, I, 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 you know, I, it just, I never told him to butt out. Um, I, you know, it was one of those, you know, I kind of rolled my eyes and, you know. Uh, but this is a real issue for merit. And she was on a was sort of this escalation of her being marginalized to the point not only she was removed from the cases that where I was the plaintiff, uh, in spite of the fact that I was very happy with the representation, but then she was excluded from conversations. She was, you know, they, they would, they being Jonathan <coughs> and Ryan would, and sometimes Giovanni even, would go and literally go into to Marty's private office and exclude her from the conversations about cases that she should have been involved with. Um, and she just felt more, and you'll see this in the email, she felt more and more and more marginalized, and I think she was. And eventually she, she, she left. I, mean, I think it was sort of a mutual, I don't know if she was fired or quit. I think she's probably more fired than she was than she quit. Okay, let me ask you this. When, when you had in February these conversations with her about Jonathan trying to negotiate more in fees than had been earned in your cases. Mm -hmm. Did that ever, uh, in February, result in you having any direct communication with Jonathan on that topic? And if there's a conversation later, you can tell me that and we'll deal with that in the chron chronologically. Yeah, I, I, I the, the, well, I don't know that we had conversations about that in Jan in February specifically. I, I can't say that within within that that particular time frame. We may have um, certainly. This is an issue that Jonathan and I really battled over uh, subsequent to this. Okay, we'll get to that. I don't want to keep you. Let me get, so, get back to your your chronology. What you were relating to me. Yeah. So things, you know, for to a very large extent, I was left alone uh, for most of February uh, and most of March. And then in uh, in April, um, I believe it was in April. Let me look at my timeline here. Um, I was contacted by um, Denise De Martini, and um, now let me find it here. Yeah, it was in, uh, I'm sorry, it was on March 27th uh, is when uh, Merritt Hanna told me she had been removed from the cases. 
What date? It was in March. Okay. Um, so some of the other, you know, where I started seeing what I refer to as red, red flags, um, I got a I got an email from uh, a woman named uh, Jill Moeller, M O H L E R. And who is she? She is the secretary receptionist for the Commerce Group. Very sweet lady, very nice lady. She's she's an employee of Marty's company yes. and has been for how long? Do you know? Uh, not long. Okay. A year or so, maybe. Receptionist. Okay. Yeah. Very nice lady. Um, uh, her, I found out from her that. Uh, and I can be completely unaware of this, that she was actually making public records requests on behalf of the foundation. This is in April. Without your knowledge? Without my knowledge. I had no idea she was doing it. And she's not an employee no, of the foundation? No, she's not an employee. She's not, not an employee or a volunteer or anything else. She's, 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 she has no affiliation with the foundation, none. How, how did you learn this? Uh, uh, she, she, I got an email from her, um, and... Uh, Uh, it, this is what the email says. Hi, Joel. Marty requested that I send you the attached records request and responses to review as well as the records request cost estimate spreadsheet also attached. Uh, after you review all, Marty would like uh, to speak with you about them. Uh, I've left you a voicemail. And, you know, and this was in relationship to uh, public records requests that have been made to Gulfstream. And, and, I was, and the name of the foundation? Yeah, the name of the foundation, which I, there were a number of issues there for me. One was, okay, you guys aren't being very clever about this because you might want to take into consideration that while you're sending this from a, a Citizens Awareness Foundation email, your transmittal sheet has the Commerce Group phone number and address on it. So, you know, it's pretty transparent who's really making the public records request. Two, I didn't authorize you to make the request. Three, the requests aren't well written. They're, they're defective, in my opinion. And four, why are we sending all these public records requests to, to Gulfstream? How, how many were there? Well, at one point, it came to my attention that hundreds had been made. And it was well over, I say hundreds, well over 100. I think, I think the number six in my head was like 160 or something. And these were made in what month or what time period? I don't know. I don't know. 2014? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Since the foundation got started, yeah. Okay, so they were made after January 22nd. Oh, yes. Over 100. In the name of the foundation, I did not know about them. I did not authorize them. And part of, the, part of the problem I have with this was the deal I had with Marty sitting by his pool on Wednesday, I think January 22nd, was no enemies list. I knew that Marty had a, a, a sort of had an axe to grind with the city, with the town of Gulfstream. And while I think that the town of Gulfstream has had a remarkable series of public records challenges, um, I, they, in my opinion, have not uh, been very uh, compliant with the Public Records Act. Um, I, I, I don't want to beat up on them. I mean, how many times do you need to sue somebody to make your point? I mean, if I have to sue the same defendant ten times in a row, fine, but I don't want to sue them ten times all at once. And I didn't see any point in making all these public records requests to a town with 500 people. I mean, there are all of these other uh, agencies in the state of Florida. There are, there are 412 municipalities. There are 67 counties, uh, which means there are 67 school districts and 67 sheriffs. And there are over 100 state agencies. And there are 1,600 community development districts. Uh, and there are probably 10,000 state, state contractors of the Public Records Act. There are lots of other people out there besides just the town of Gulfstream. And if we're making hundreds of public records requests to one very small agency, it really looks like we're picking on them. Like an enemies list. Yeah, which was part of the deal. No enemies list. And you knew that Marty had a uh, bone to chew with Gulfstream, I take it, from your prior conversations with him. Yeah, sure. Yeah, I mean, I knew about him painting his house. And, and, and I mean, I personally, look, I personally had sued Gulfstream over a public records violation. So I, I, I knew that, that the public records issues there were very real. Uh, and frankly, it is remarkable to me that they have been slow, so slow to really get their house in order. It's a course, tiny, tiny local tiny government, town. one or two employees, sure. local, local employees. Yes. Let me ask you this. When you learned that Jill Mahler, when you learned in March, mm -hmm. that Jill Mahler... April, I think. April, yeah. April, had 
at Marty's direction, sent out well over 100 public records requests in the name of the foundation to Gulfstream without your permission. What was your what did you do? What was your reaction? Uh, I was pretty upset. Um, and this led to uh, conversations that I have with uh, Bill Ring, as president of the foundation, um, that we couldn't be doing this, this that we can't have this. I, I, I need to be the only person that's making public records requests, or if I'm not the only person making public records requests, then, then I need to be the only, I need to be the person that approves them. By this juncture, there were three employees from the foundation. I was the executive director. I hired a woman by the name of Kathy Zolo, Z-O-L-L-O, uh, who uh, worked from her home in Sarasota. To my knowledge, I don't think she's ever ever been to the office in Deerfield Beach. I don't think she's ever met Marty or any of the other. She's talked to Denise DiMartini on the phone, but she's never had any contact with them. And then we had an intern, a guy named uh, Dylan Bauscher. Um, and I directed them to make public records requests on behalf of the foundation, but I never directed anybody else to make public records requests, certainly nobody outside the foundation. I take it you didn't even know who Jill Mahler was at the time she was no, making all this. Well, I knew she was. I mean, I, I spoke to Jill every time I walked through the door. Hey, Jill, how are you? So you, you knew she was a receptionist for the for the commerce group. Yeah, what I found out was, I, you know, it's funny because she, you know, we, I walk in and there's this big stack of paper and she's, you know, all, you know, all the time doing something on the computer. I found out later what she was doing on the computer was making public records requests. I mean... My understanding from her and from other people in the in the at the commerce group, this was like a full time enterprise where she was doing nothing but making public records requests and making them to other entities besides Gulfstream. Oh, Gulfstream over and over and over again. But what about any other entities? Does she do any other? I don't know. Okay. I mean, I know one time on you know for 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 Marty or the commerce group, she was making lots of public records requests to the state attorney and other agencies like that, but. And I didn't care about that. The what I was concerned about was that, 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 that there was somebody who was presenting themselves as being a representative of the foundation and making public records requests on behalf of the foundation without my knowledge and without my authorization. And I had a problem with that for the, the first big issue I had was it looked like an enemies list. And the only one you learned about uh, being done in the name of the foundation through Jill Mahler and Marty was Gulfstream was the target, no others. Uh, I think there was a, a I, I think at one time I found out about uh, uh, I think it was an engineering firm I think that, that uh, did work for Gulfstream, but they, they all related to Gulfstream, the ones okay. that I knew about. And uh -huh. I found that very upsetting. And these were not authorized by the foundation or you? Not by me. And when you talked to Bill Ring, you complained to him about this. I sure did. And what did he say? Sort of, yeah, you know, okay, I'll talk to Marty about it kind of thing. And, you know, and, and, I, and, and the reason I didn't escalate this was each, this came up over more than one time. Every time I'd sort of get this pat on the head, yeah, you're right, okay, we'll take care of it. And bear in mind, I wasn't there very much, right? I, I, I showed up at the offices in Deerfield Beach once a week, once every couple of weeks. The rest of the time I was out on the road, you know, meeting with civil rights groups and doing audits. Um, so I, you know, I didn't really have a lot of contact with them, uh, not, certainly not, not on a daily basis. Um, and then in, in the, uh, during this period in, in April's when things really started to become more unhinged, um, the, uh, Yeah, on April 14th, I got an email from uh, Denise DiMartini, who was a board member, who I was ultimately directed by uh, the board, meaning Bill Ring and Denise DiMartini, that she was the person that I answered to directly. She was my direct superior. And she's Marty's uh, administrative assistant. I think she's more than that. I think she, I, I don't know what her official title is, but she's, she... His right hand. Uh, that's very. I, I. Yeah. My sense is, and I think that other people that are at the Commerce Group would share this sense, that there's Marty, and then there's Denise and Bill, and then there's everybody else way way behind them. They. She. I don't think anything happens at the Commerce Group of any import without Bill and Denise being involved with it. So I got a. I got a um, email from her. Um, and this precipitated the conversation that I had subsequently with Bill Ring, 
and led to a whole series of other conflicts with the board. Um, she described her involvement with the firm, and I'm reading from her email, which is uh, April 14, 2014. My involvement with the firm, the, the overall law firm, is primarily to get procedures, priorities, expectations in place for the attorney so that things run smoother. The firm's priority is to keep up with the intake of cases, so we uh, want you to run with it, no holding back, so we can properly staff up. Obviously, there are going to be bumps along the way, uh, but we can overcome. My concern was uh, it became... She, 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 right, she's, as far as you understood, she was on the board and she was an employee of Mr. O'Boy, Martin O'Boyle's Commerce Group. Yes. She sends you that email. Did you understand she was trying to now assist Jonathan's law firm? Yes. Did that come as a surprise, <laughs> surprise yes, to you? Yes, it did. It was shocking <coughs> to me and I objected to it vociferously. And she, because your whole idea of independence was out the window... Yeah, yeah, and and it was portrayed. The reason she's exp the reason she's giving this explanation in the email is I've objected to. Wait a minute, what, why is a board member involved with a law firm? And what I understood her to try to be saying is, well, I'm just kind of you know, I'm, I'm kind of helping them uh, make sure they get business. Well, no, that's not what I I understood for her to be saying. That I'm just I'm just kind of helping them figure out. You know procedures. You know, how to you know the workflow. Just make things consulting you know, with them to yeah, try to help them. Yeah, yeah. Staff up, which was utter nonsense. And I raised this issue with Bill Ring. I said, "Look, you cannot have Denise D. Martini, a board member of the foundation and an employee of of Marty, involved with the operation of the law firm." And my argument that she was involved with the operation of the law firm, she was actually managing law firm meetings. You went to meetings at the law firm where she was there? She was, no, she, I mean, this, was, this is the creepy part, right? She's not even there. She's on speakerphone running the meeting. Uh, so who, who's present during these meetings? The entire law firm. Now, I was there, I, which, I, I, you know, I, I subsequently uh, refused to go to the, the, the law firm meetings. How many of these meetings were you at? Uh, uh, just the one. And um, she ran it from a speakerphone? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And what lawyers were there? Giovanna Mesa, uh, Nick Taylor... I think Merritt was still there at this time, John Little Boyle, Ryan Whitmer, and uh, Beth Canale, who is the, uh, the paralegal. Um, and I was uncomfortable with the meeting for several reasons. The first and most obvious is that you have a non-attorney who is a board member who I report to directly, who is clearly, clearly running this meeting. That's the first thing that just struck me as beyond bizarre. Um, did she say she was doing it on behalf of, that she was giving direction from Martin O'Boyle? No. It was just clear that she was running the meeting. Okay. Um, and when I say running the meeting, it's, it's sort of, you know, well, which cases do we have coming in? Which attorneys have these, these been assigned to? What's the status of this case? And it wasn't even, when I say the status of the case, it just hasn't been filed yet or not. Not a, any meaningful case management, which I found very frustrating. Um, there, there didn't seem to be any comprehension on her part about settlement horizons or, or, you know, procedural issues. You know, do we have, are, are we doing any media hearing? Are we, you know, going to go for summary judgment? There, there was none of that. It was just everything sort of... Was, every, it sounds like everything was about, tell me if this is correct, everything she was focusing on was about generating a number of lawsuits for the O'Boyle law firm. Yes. The second objection I had was that I thought that I was there because we were going to talk about the foundation cases. It made perfect sense to me that we would get all the attorneys together because it would be much more efficient to do that. But what we ended up doing is that well, while I was there, they ended up having conversations about other clients, which I found very troubling because I'm not a part of the lawsuits. Public records cases. Yes. Uh, I had referred to the, the firm... Uh, a number of, of uh, clients, people that had contacted me, people some some of them I've known for years, some that just contacted me out of the blue. Uh, you know, they have public records issues, and I'm not an attorney, but you know, I have a law firm. That Can you give them. me names of those people? Yeah, uh, a guy named Jeff Gray, um, who gave them a large number of cases, um, which have, in my estimation, been terribly problematic. Um, Where's Mr. Gray? Uh, Jeff Gray. Uh, 
lives in uh, St. Augustine. He's a he's a civil rights activist. We do a lot of work together. He's a good guy. Very okay. Very reasonable. Well, later, I may want to get his phone number from you, but I'll be happy to give that to you. Um, the problem that he ran into was the, the cases that he was. In fact, he was the he was one of the the activists that was attending this seminar I did the first week of the foundation. Um, he had referred a number of cases to, I think he gave a total of 42 cases to the firm, and they were not filing them in a timely fashion. He was, it was very frustrating, and he didn't feel like they were communicating with him. Um, were these cases in St. Augustine? or No, they're all over the state. All over the state. Yeah. Um, and I was frustrated because, uh, number one, Jeff and I are friends, and I didn't feel like he was really being treated very well. I didn't think he was getting good customer service. Um, but also, just from an advocacy perspective, my I feel, <clears throat> generally speaking, that if you're going to file a public records lawsuit, you need to do it pretty quickly after the, the, the violation of your rights for a whole lot of reasons, not least of which, if you wait six months to do it, it doesn't really look like, look like you're all that interested in the records. Um, so uh, that was one of the issues. Uh, he did, he just didn't feel like he was being, being treated very well. And did well. they discuss... Jeff Gray oh, yeah, at these meetings in front of you. Yes, absolutely. Even though it was a different client. Even though it was a different client. Okay. There's no consideration for privilege whatsoever. And who else? Who else did uh, you refer to them? Uh, a fellow by the name of Al Crespo, um, down in Miami. C R E S P O. Yeah. I may want his number later. Yeah. Did they discuss him in front of you at yes. this meeting too? Yes. Okay, and, and uh, no protection of his privacy. I mean. I, and I, now I knew about the cases because the, these Al contacted me asking for a referral. Jeff had contacted me asking for a referral, so I knew the basic. And, and I, I guess one of the the uh, value added things I brought to the relationship was I have enough experience in public record litigation that I can look at the facts of the case and I have a pretty good sense of whether I think they're worth doing or not. I don't make that judgment. I don't share that judgment with the with with the potential plaintiff. But I certainly share that judgment with the attorneys. The attorneys would ask me, is this a good case? Yeah, I think it is, or no, I don't think it is. I mean, do I think you should take it? No. Yes, you know, you should, whatever, based on the facts. So I was very intimate. So intimate. the lawyers had, uh, at the firm would ask you? Yeah, sure. At the oil firm? Yeah. <coughs> but Crespo and Gray had never authorized uh, the lawyers to speak to you about their case. I don't know whether they did or not. I, okay. don't, I would have said they never they told you that? Okay. Yeah. But I, I, I was very uncomfortable with this because it was very clear that, that Denise was, was running the meeting. And then subsequent, she, she started demanding from me uh, an accounting of how many cases I was given to the firm. And in fact, I received an email from her just to kind of show that this was not a one-time event. Um, you know, and, and again, Marty was still very involved at this point. So, for example, Marty was approving the mission statement, and this is in on April sixteenth. I get an email from Denise saying that Marty's approved the the mission statement. Um, I got on, uh, and let me just shift gears a little bit because we're gonna we're kind of all over the map here. That just kind of keep things in chronological order. So, I'm, on April fourteenth, I get the email from Denise explaining her involvement with the law firm. Um, then I get uh, an email from Jonathan uh, saying that he has assigned a case to himself. A Florida case? Yes. So he, he, he's asking me, he's, I got an email from him, I do think you, it was on a Saturday. Do you know which case it was? Yeah, it's a, a case against the Department of Children and Family Services, DCF, DFC. Uh, brought the, by I think he meant DCF. Brought by whom? The foundation. And, and he told you he was assigning that well, case Well, I'll, I'll read you the email. Hey, Joel, the, he says DFC, I think he meant DCF. The, the DFC link is not working. And what he means by link is I, was, I had to set up a Dropbox account, and I would upload, you know, if I had video or if I had, email exchange, whatever documents, whatever, whatever, whatever I had to support the, uh, the facts of the case, I would upload those into Dropbox, and that's how I shared them with the attorneys at, at okay. a distance. Let, let me just ask you this on yeah. this topic. Did you ever direct uh, 
Jonathan O'Boyle to take over that case, or did he just tell you he was taking over the case? I didn't direct him to do anything. Okay. All right, let's move on to the next thing then. Yeah, well, he's, then he says, I have assigned myself the case. Uh, any chance you can get that link, uh, get the link to the video. So, I mean, it, it, here he clearly seems to be saying that he is not working in the direction of another attorney. He's assigned it to himself. Okay. Um, then it's on uh, the 16th of April, I get the email from Denise DiMartini saying that Marty's approved the mission statement for the foundation. Um, then I get a, a very troubling email on, from Denise on April 28th. And the email reads, and this is April 28, 2014, at 11.17 a.m. Joel, I am in the law meeting now and have been told that you have only provided eight new cases for this week. We were expecting a minimum of 25 a week. Um, I've pretty much flipped out after that. Um, number one, I don't have a quota for cases. Any cases that, that are the result of the advocacy that I do or however many we get. If it's a lot, it's a lot. If there's none, there's none. My paycheck's not affected by whether we get lawsuits. That's not what I'm being paid to do. I'm not hired to go out and gin up lawsuits. I'm hired to go out and do civil rights ad advocacy. And it's very clear at this point that she thinks that my job is nothing more than to get lawsuits. And I was very disturbed by that. I was also disturbed that she was continuing to be a part of these meetings. So she's clearly in the law firm meeting <coughs> as... I guess a commerce group employee, a member of the board, I don't know, working for the firm, who knows what the deal is. But I have somebody who I'm reporting to, while she's in a law firm meeting, telling me she expects 25 cases a week. And suddenly, this starts to feel like something very different than what I signed up for. And what it's feeling like is, I'm really getting paid to go out and get lawsuits, which is not what I agreed to do and was not my job description. Well, were the lawsuits ever, did you ever try to send the lawsuits to some firm other than the O'Boyle law I firm? did, as a matter of fact. Um, there was a case that I tried to send to the, uh, to Thomas and LeCicero, who in my estimation are the preeminent open government litigators in the state of Florida, have represented me personally for a number of years. Um, there was a, actually a very good case with excellent facts uh, the University of South Florida, uh, Barnes & Noble College Booksellers. They operate the, have a contract to operate the bookstore at USF as well as a number of other uh, bookstores around the state at state universities. And my brother and I went in there in April, I think it was April 24th, uh, to, I made a public records request on behalf of the foundation and he made a public records request on his own behalf and they told us no, we couldn't have. We asked for uh, the adoption forms, uh, the the bookstore sends out a uh, request to all the faculty asking which textbooks they're going to need for the upcoming semester, and they fill out these adoption forms, and we want copies of them. And the reason we were making this request is Barnes & Noble got sued over this a number of years ago. In fact, there was a fourth DCA decision uh, that said that they have to make these forms available. They're clearly public records because they're acting on behalf of the university. And the facts that we got in that audit were virtually identical to the, I want to say it was a 1998 case, uh, uh, Booksmart versus Barnes & Noble, virtually identical facts to a, 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 an appellate decision that's already come down. And uh, I, my brother uh, continues to use Thomas and LeCicero. Uh, Thomas and LeCicero still represents me personally in some ongoing public records litigation. And uh, we shared, Robert shared with them, my brother Robert shared with them what happened, and they expressed some interest in the case. It's interesting. It's a good case. And uh, because the cause of action accrued in Hillsborough County, and Thomas and LeCicero has an office in Hillsborough County, and they are excellent uh, public records litigators and appellate attorneys, and they had expressed an interest in it. I thought, well, this would be, this is the one. If we're going to refer one to another law firm, this is where I'd like to start. And so I sent an email to Bill Ring asking his for his approval as chairman, uh, the president of the board, uh, to do that. And he responded by telling me I couldn't do it. He and Denise had talked about it, and I can't. I 
can't refer it to them, that he's not inclined to let me refer any cases to any other law firm besides the Oboe Law Firm. What was your reaction to that? Uh, I was very unhappy about that. Um, and a lot of these things came to a head in May. Um, I had a, we, we had tried to schedule a meeting, because it was the first and only face-to-face -face meeting I had with the board the entire time I was there. And this was in, in May. Okay, before you go to that, yep. help the reporter and me. The law firm was Thomas? Thomas and LeCicero. T-H-O-M-A-S? Uh-huh. And? LeCicero, L, and see, you're going to ask me to spell it, and I'm going to be embarrassed because... Uh, La Cicero. Cicero. Yeah, L... Let's just get, get close. Well, where, where are they in what town? They're, 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 in, they're in Tampa. Hold on a second. Um, if I was writing it out, I could tell you. I can look it up. Let's see. I can give you the exact spelling here. Uh, and they, they represent you currently and have represented you? For a long time. Well, Cicero is capital L, lowercase o, capital C-I-C-E-R-O. And in Tampa, okay. And yep. you were going to give me names of other clients that you had referred to the O'Boyle Law Firm. Yeah, Al Jeff Gray, Al Crespo. Um, I'd have to go back and look. I can't remember. Okay. All right. Now, please, you were going to you were yeah, going to so go to we, May, and then let's break. I would like to get a little lunch. Yeah, sure. Um, there were these issues that were that were building. The the first was well, not in any particular order. There was the issue of, of Jill Moeller making public record requests on behalf of the foundation without my knowledge or authorization, and apparently a lot of them going to Gulfstream, which I found deeply troubling. Then I found out <clears throat> that a lawsuit had been filed on behalf of the foundation against Gulfstream without my knowledge. Only one you learned of? I think there was one. Um, well, you I, don't know now if there were more. Or not. I don't know. I mean, who knows? I mean, the, the problem was no lawsuits were supposed to be filed without me authorizing them and me supervising the, the litigation and making decisions about settlement. And then I come to find out that no, a lawsuit had already been filed against Gulfstream without you know, my knowledge. Do you know which lawyer filed it? I don't know. I, somebody at the O'Boyle Law Firm. Do you know if Jonathan O'Boyle had any direction directed that? Uh, I don't know. Okay. Um, How did you learn that a lawsuit had been filed by the foundation? against Gulfstream without your knowledge? I want to say that I think Giovanni Mesa mentioned it to me because um, he did, he was expressing real concerns, ethical concerns as well, very much like what uh, um, Merritt, had, had, Merritt Hanna had expressed. Uh, 